Great Plymouth Sale is now. Beep, beep. Featuring special savings on specially equipped Fury, Valiant, Barracuda, and Belvedere models. Savings on such extras as white wall tires, vinyl roof, all vinyl interior, and other popular options. All during the Great beep, beep, Plymouth beep, Sale. Beep. So for a great deal on specially equipped Plymouth, head for your Plymouth dealer. You'll see, when Plymouth has a sale, it isn't just good, it's great. Beep, beep. Just look what Plymouth Beep, beep. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Very deep in the Pacific Northwest. One team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin, Doug, his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, his assembly tech, Justin and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. Okay, just to refresh everybody's memory, because it has been a while, years ago, I won't say how many, we brought in a 1969 CUDA. Now, this was the first year they called it the CUDA, even though people did before that. This is an A57 69 CUDA 383 four-speed car. When it comes to A-body collectible cars, desirable, this is at the top of the list. Now, that's right, this is the very first time Plymouth called a Barracuda a CUDA, a muscle version. Now, before that, people had 64 and a half, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69 evens that weren't CUDA models that they'd call a CUDA. It was just, it rolls off the tongue easy. But the actual model was introduced in the spring of 1969 in an A56, an A57, or an A12, which is your 440 CUDA, M code, I think they call it. Very, very rare stuff. So when the car came in, it didn't look too bad at a glance. It was all together, it was painted, it had a repaint or two. And like I say, it was basically together. But once the car was dipped, once it came back, that's when all the sins are revealed. There was a lot of metal replacement that needed to be done on the car. Most importantly, somebody had put fender well exit headers on this car. Now fender well exit headers, all you car guys out there are gonna know this, the old street rotters, a big block, in an A-body is a very tight fit. No real room for manifolds, although they did make a special manifold for the left-hand side, and that's what came from the factory. But most guys wanted headers, so they just punched holes in the inner fenders. Great big, they'd take a cutting torch, they'd cut out these great big access holes and run the headers out through there. That's what they call the fender well exit header. Well, this car had that done to it, plus it had a certain amount of rust and damage to the front rails and the front aprons. So I thought it was in the best interest of the car to put a complete front inner structure, a donor inner structure on the car, much like we did on our General Lee. Now, when you're replacing something as large as a front inner structure, you don't want any evidence that anybody has been there. You're not trying to hide it. You just don't want it to be obvious that it was done. Everybody knows we showed it on TV. The owner knows it. But you don't want to have signs that we were there. So dissecting the original part that's going to be a donor, then dissecting the original one off of there, saving the panels that are supposed to be saved, like the firewall, and putting this panel on, duplicating the spot welds. That in itself is a bit of an art, but that's what we had to do on this car. Once we had the used donor inner structure welded securely onto the car, it is structurally sound at that moment. Even though we have it on a frame jig, it's structurally sound. We can cut the rest of it apart, those rust panels that need to be replaced. So we did end up replacing the main floor in the car, the under seat pan, 
Let's see, we did left and right quarter panels, outer wheelhouses, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions. So I know we did some work on the frame rails. Now, before we can kick this car over to the mud shop, over to Will's area, so they can start smoothing it, I had to give the final sign off on how the metal fit. I worked with George on this back when George was here. We went over the cars, door gaps, trunk to quarter alignments, areas that were low, do they need to be fixed in metal or is it something that just needs a skim coat of mud to make look right? Those are the things I had to do before it was ready to go over to Will. Once I did that, I gave it the great big thumbs up, it was done, handed it over to Will, he took it from there. Once all the metal work was done on our Cuda, I got it right out to the mud room so the guys can start doing their body work. It's difficult for blocking because there's no flat spots on the car, minus the hood. There's a lot of, lot of round contours between the roof, fenders, quarter panels. It's just not a very straight car. Because they did such a good job on the body work, they got it done quick, right back over to me so we can start priming and blocking it. You know, underneath the hood, when it comes to the engine compartment, it's just like any other Mopar that we do. Tons of nooks, crannies, little areas that you really gotta take your time and do that fine sanding. So when it comes to B5, it's a beautiful color, but it's very transparent. The prep work has to be done perfect. This is one of the last cars we did a pre-paint on. And it was a good thing that we did because we did miss a few little things. So it was nice to have the whole car blue, address a few little issues, and it made the final paint go a lot quicker and easier. So after the pre-paint was done, we did a couple of touch-ups, got it in the booth, got it ready for final paint. Yes, the car is blue, so you think you can just go around it and put three or four coats and you're done. But because there were primer spots, you still have to get seven coats of color over that primer spot. So I ended up putting six or seven coats of color over the whole entire car to ensure there's no, no transparent spots whatsoever. Then I was able to clear it. Car came out amazing, of course, because I did it. Because we haven't done a car like this before, it is cool. The combination, the painted wheels, the color, the stripes, the decals, that aspect that makes it a pretty cool car. This was one of the coolest drivetrains I've built out so far. I admit I had to work with Mark and Tony a lot on detailing items because this was my first big block A body. But with their help, I managed to get it all built out correctly. Mark and I installed the drivetrain together. It's a pretty straightforward installation for the most part. The rear end goes in first, so we have the counterbalance we need to install, the engine, transmission, and K-member assembly. Come down a little, or is it good for you? Uh, my side's pegged. Okay. You, can, you can lower it more. Once we had the rear end installed, we went to the front of the car and installed the engine and K-member assembly. Once we had the K-member bolts tightened in, all we had to do was install the cross member for the transmission and then button up the suspension. And after that, we could lower it down, put the wheels on, and make it a roller. So where our little A57 Cuda is today is all of the body work's done, all of the paint work is done, undercoating is done, we have it as a roller, the drivetrain is installed. Now's the time I get to hand it off to assembly. That's Justin's our lead assembly tech. He'll take over. One of the first things he's going to want to do are the graphics. These are very special graphics, and I'm glad that he's done a lot of this stuff now. I feel very safe in handing that off to him. The sales success of 68 provides conclusive evidence that there is a sizable 1969 market for Charger's exclusive styling identity. Standard Charger engines are the 225 cubic inch 6 and the 318 cubic inch V8. And both the 383 cubic inch 2-barrel and 4-barrel V8 engines are optional on regular Charger models. The standard engine in the 1969 Charger RT is the potent 440 cubic inch Magnum V8. And there's only one step up from there, the 426 Hemi. 
and the RT Performance Boys will welcome the new 3.55 and 3.91 axle ratios for use with torque flight. And for the four-speed manual, there's an optional sure grip axle with a 3.54 or 4.10 ratio and a nine and three-quarter ring gear. And it moves. So today we're gonna to put the decals on the 1969 Barracuda. This is the first time I've done this, and how about you? Oh, for sure. For sure? Yeah, on the, on the I'm 69? not trusted to do any decals, really. <laughs> oh, Unless you it's and with Will? My dad. Now, what Alyssa's talking about here is true. Her and Will galactically screwed up the Phantom Cuda. If you recall, they went through two sets of decals, even though I showed them exactly how to do it, and still ruined them. So I pulled their privileges away. Okay, look, I admit it. I messed up the billboard on the 71 Phantom Cuda. But it wasn't all my fault. I think Will had more to do that with that than I did. He was supposed to be my teacher. He was the more experienced one. He's like 20 years older than me. How does that fall on me? Will has never earned his back. That's right, he's not allowed to do graphics, okay? Alyssa, I thought, because she's the fruit of my loin, my seed, there's gotta be some redeemable quality in there. So I worked with her on the 1971 Cuda 343 speed car, one of only one ever made. That was a purple car with white billboards. She did an amazing job. She earned all of her credit back. She earned all of her privileges back at that time. And I think the more of these cars she does, the better off she's gonna be. So yeah, we're gonna put the decals on the car and then put the hood scoops in and a couple ornamentation pieces. And then we can move on to other parts of the car. Let's spray this thing down first. Clean it up. Do one side at a time, right? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. I want you to cut me loose on my own side, okay? You want to do the other side? No, no, I do not. No? Okay. No, 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 because if this if goes wrong, we're both taking the blame. Okay. Is that yeah. okay? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great that Alyssa wants to continue to learn how to install graphics. You know, I'm super happy to, you know, teach her what I've learned, but in all honesty, I've, I mess up from time to time. I just hope I don't mess these up in front of her because what kind of teacher would I be? Don't want any contaminants under that decal. Okay, we're gonna separate bring it, right? Bring that over, yeah. <laughs> Wet this down first. I hate these big decals, stressful. Do you feel stressed out when you do these now or are you like? Every time. Yeah? Okay, Every it doesn't time. get easier. That's good yeah, to know. Because now that I'm doing them more, he stops buying two. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So with the A57 cars, there's a lot of graphics. You have your sports stripes or blackouts on the hood. They carry on to the header panel. Now those are a vinyl graphic. So we get those from Phoenix Graphics. The front valance and the rear valance tie in to the body side graphics. They're painted. Now the rest of the graphics on the car, the lower graphics on the side, they're vinyl. So it's a combination of both vinyl graphic and paint. It is a lot of studying to make sure that you get these things right. They're very unique. Thank you for already pre-marking it out. Yeah, so what really I got nice. what I got right here are these little hash marks. Perfect. And we lined it up on that and then on the edge of the tape, Ooh. as long as the edge of the backing paper mm -hmm. is centered in between that, that's exactly where it needs to go. And then these hash marks can get our forward and back. So once we got that lined up really nice, we can start pressing the decal down with our squeegees. This is such a beautiful car. I love the matte black against that blue. So beautiful. This Cuda is definitely becoming one of my favorites. So we'll start from this middle part right here. I'll go this way. Just a little gentle press or else sometimes these like to grip it and, and then, then completely it. slide yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was afraid of. I remember most of this from the purple Cuda. You wanna put the decals in place and then slowly start massaging out the soapy water. You work from the inside out to make sure that you don't get a bubble in the middle of the decal. Making sure it's still lined up the whole time. Yep. Okay, right here, it's kinda. Is it doing, is it moving on your side at no, all? No, I think it's good. Nice, perfect. You know, I love working with my dad. He really knows his stuff. But when it comes to stuff like this, I'd prefer working with Justin, someone who's a little more calm. My dad likes to do stupid stuff, start his impressions or do a movie line I don't care or know. And it just adds intensity to an already intense moment. So I definitely prefer working with Justin when it comes to this type of stuff. So with this, is that okay if it kind of folds down in that? Yeah, you can tuck it down in the in front of the hood. So what we'll do is we'll move on to the other side before we even pull this off. 
Okay. And it allows it time to set up a little bit better. Alyssa's doing a great job. We got the passenger side on without any bubbles or any damage, so now it's time to move on to the driver's side. Just kind of work it through. Move up there. There you go. Oh. There you go. Boom, got the Sweet. decal done, good job. Good. Thank you. So we got the hood and header decals installed perfectly. It was super easy, I am stoked. I can't wait to see all of the trim on this car. All right, hood insert, that drop down in there. Ah, perfect fit. Nice, there we go. Now another part of the A57 package are some of the options you got. Neat features, I should say, not options if they're standard. That there, that there's not an option, that they're standard. I know, Tony, just relax, have a sandwich, chill out. For example, the hood scoops. These are simulated scoops. They're not really cold air. They don't bring cold air into the engine compartment, but they sure look cool. They look tough. All A57, A56, I think part of that package had bright tips on the exhaust too, standard. The exhaust tips, the uh, N42. So those are just a couple things. I'm sure there's plenty more. The A-body guys out there calling me an idiot because I don't know all this stuff, but it's not easy to know everything about a thousand cars, even though I say I do on TV. There it is, my first A-body graphics set. It was so nice to work with Justin and it's so rewarding to be able to stand back and look at your finished product. I know the owner is going to love this car. The 1969 Charger is more car than Cougar and Firebird and more car for the money. In 69, Charger RT models are available with or without these popular racing stripes. And if the pace continues, more than half of RT owners will want them in 69. And standard instrumentation will include gauges, not warning lights, for fuel, temperature, oil pressure, and alternator. Both a rally clock and a 150 mile per hour speedometer are standard. And the popular clock and tachometer combination is optional. For music lovers, the stereo tape radio combination shown here offers three speakers in the instrument panel and two in the rear, sharing space with the optional and practical rear window defogger. Well, for you A-Body fans, this is a great episode, a great week. We are moving our other special A-Body car through the shop, the 1971 Demon, Mr. Norm's car. As you recall, we recently finished all the body and paint work on it. Doug just recently finished building out the engine and getting it detailed correctly. We did a little feature on that. Well, now it's time to install it. Now, again, remember, 340, six-pack, four-speed, real Mr. Norm's, all numbers matching. Okay, slide on in. Do a lot of A-bodies, do we, Rooster? No, this is gonna be a little different. Is yours in? No. Okay, you wanna put one in and then we'll get the other one in, or how do you wanna do it? This is gonna need a twist, so if you wanna get your set and put a nut on it, that'll be fine. Okay. So this is another really cool A-body that I'm starting to fall in love with. It has so much heritage because it's a Mr. Norm's car, I know everyone will love it when it's done. You got one? Yep. Okay, go ahead and put your... Not on that one, or at least one of them. Uh-huh. A-bodies have a completely different setup here on this rear axle assembly as far as they, how they hang it in the back. Yeah, Mark's right. All of the B and E body cars have holes in the rear frame rail for the shackle grommets to go through. The A-body uses a bolt-on shackle mount, and these are kind of tricky. I'm never sure which is supposed to go on first, the bracket to the body or the bracket to the shackle. <laughs> we always seem to figure it out. Lower that bad boy down. We'll yeah. roll these shackles into place. All right. You like shackles, don't you, Dougie? I sure do. Yeah. I've noticed Mark has a new habit. I think he invents these things just to drive people nuts. That or because he is nuts. All right. There we okay. go. That's a little nicer. You got there. yours? 
Oh, excellent. You know, Doug says I'm a nut job. Doug's a nut job, believe me, trust me folks. <laughs> He's got these little ticks that he comes up with. One day we were driving around in the car and he says, do you want me to roll the window up? I go, yeah, what the heck, roll the window up, it's free. Which it is, it's free to roll up the window. Now he says it all the time. You want a shackle plate? Sure. It's free. Well, they're not free, are they? <laughs> I had to buy them. And, and he does that with everything, everything is free. If you go to a, a, a restaurant with him and I'll say, why don't you have the burger? Why wouldn't I, it's free. It isn't free. Well, nut. Okay, I got I'm working with one. <laughs> I guess you don't want a nut then, huh? I'll take a metal nut. There you go. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. The best. By the way, what? Speaking of bull tacos. Yeah. I got my tank back from Will. Had the pinstriper do the pinstripe on it. It's absolutely stunning. That is going to bring back some good memories. <clears throat> Last time Royal had that bike, he just tore the hell out of it. Yeah, I cut the seat up, right? Uh -huh. He didn't help it any either, because he's hard on everything. That poor old bike, I bet that thing is in the junkyard now. What do you want to bet? <laughs> oh, I remember the bull taco. It took me under a fence one time. I have a scar on my leg today to prove it. Royal and Mark got into a fight because Mark said that Royal spit on his pool table. So Royal took off running, and Mark couldn't catch him. So he went bananas and cut up Royal's motorcycle seat cover with a sickle. And I'm the nut. Boy, it was a fast bike. It'd keep up with your TM400 on a straight stretch. Yeah, for a few seconds. For a few it, seconds. Till it flooded, flooded out and out. died. <laughs> what a weird anomaly. Funny thing about motorcycles, I huh? I never did understand that. Well, now this is true. That bull taco was a screaming demon. I mean, it would take Doug on an open stretch to the hole, as they say in basketball. It would take him to the hole. But then all of a sudden, it'd just flood out. Why did throttle just die, flood out, and never run again the rest of the day? Maybe until it cooled down. Now, back then, I didn't know what it was. I still don't completely understand it. But I am building a duplicate to that bike now. And it's a beauty. It's graveyard car style, 1972 Boltaco 125 Persang. M89. For those of you who are Boltaco fans out there, the Michael 89. All right. Right there? Yeah. You like that? Okay. Let me move this out of our way here. Nobody's upset, are they? Nope. Nobody's upset. Super Trey. Did I tell you I'm changing my name to Super Trey? Yeah, it's exciting. Um, you know, it was Ice Trey for a long time. But then I got to think, why not be Super Trey, right? Because now it's, everybody says, oh, Ice Trey this, Ice Trey, you're so funny. You know, you're the best. But now they can say it about Super Trey. Oh, God, watch out for Super Trey. You know, he don't play. There you go. Super Trey don't play. <laughs> Let's see how many of you gearheads have been paying attention. What gear ratios are available on the Charger RT model with a manual transmission? 3.54 and 4.10, 3.55 and 3.91, or the 3.91 and 4.11. Do you think you're sharp enough to know the answer? Stay tuned after the break to find out. Welcome back. Let's see how well you know your gears. What gear ratios are available on the Charger RT model with a manual transmission? 3.54 and 4.10, 3.55 and 3.91, or the 3.91 and 4.11? If you said 3.54 and 4.10, you are correct. And keep considering yourself a true gearhead. The 3.55 and 3.91 ratios were available axle packages behind the torque flight transmission. 4.11 gears were only available in crap box bow tie cars. In addition, an improved shore grip differential features improved traction, particularly under low torque conditions. And quick stopping power disc brakes, a smart option for the high performance crowd. Other popular features that Charger will continue to offer in 1969 include the low cost vacuum operated speed control. And that's why the Charger will continue to be the most beautiful and wanted car of 1969. Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. So the rear end installation went fine. We got it all buttoned up. Now for the fun stuff. 
installing the 346 pack. I can't wait to see the Hemi Orange engine against the Rally Red paint and that cool air cleaner. It's going to be great. You're not going to find an easier fit. <laughs> I mean, you okay. remember, right? Yeah. OK. When you're putting a drivetrain in one of these cars, you have to be mindful of scratching things. If you talk about like a 426 Hemi, like in our 69 Hemi Roadrunner we did a few years ago, power steering car. So you got that great big clumsy power steering box there. You got a 426 Hemi that just doesn't fit between the aprons unless you rock it like this. And then you come along to our 340 little A-body car fits like a glove. You don't have those clearance issues. Even though the car is a little bit narrower than that B-body I mentioned, that LA engine and manual steering gear fit in there like a glove. You still got to be careful. You don't want to scratch anything, but fits so much nicer. We need to side shift this way. This More? way. Oh, I am. Hold it. OK. So when I knock the car off the lift, that's far enough? That'd be fine. OK. OK. Sounds good. Sounds good. The car is moving. Well, yeah, I moved the car with that last shot. It's OK. It's all right. It's OK. <laughs> Blue Bays! OK. Um, yet another insane thing Mark is doing, he screams blueberries out of nowhere all the time because a guy screamed it in a restaurant one time, and Mark thought that was cool. Remember how one time it used to be Gundars, then it was Tango and Cash? Now it's blueberries! You like blueberry pancakes there, Tiny? Tiny who? Little tiny dancer don't like blueberries? OK, let me try something. Well, it still needs a massive tip back, right? Is that what you're thinking? Get it in position, then tip back? It needs to come back one more inch. It needs to go to the left just a little bit. So it'll come this in This is lined up pretty good. And then get it in position, then tip it up. OK. This part is the most nerve wracking. It's hard enough when it's just Mark and I. But when the cameras are on us, they catch everything. Shifting to the left. OK. A lot of you guys recall back, just even a couple of seasons ago, we were using an installation rack that I had built, where you put the drivetrain on it and you lower the car down around it. And that's similar to the way the factory did it, except they had a jig that would bring it up into it, I think, and bring the car down. I came up, because I was working one weekend by myself, with using the deuce on, use the forklift. And because it's such long forks, and it has full articulation up and down, side to side, you can set that drivetrain on there, and you can adjust it anywhere you want. Hand me oh. your pony. Yes, sir. My little pony. You want me to lower the body a little bit? You could, yeah. Same as all the cars, the hardest part is getting the K-member aligned and getting the four K-member bolts in place. Once you do that, it's just a matter of getting the transmission cross-member in place and buttoning up the front suspension. The boys and girls in TV land, how's everybody doing? PD, how you doing, man? Good, good, man. How you doing, little tiny dancer? Good, good, good. Do you need that knife back from my, between my shoulder blades? So I really don't get the whole backstabbing reference. I know what he's talking about. One time I let a customer in a little early to see his own car. I'm just doing my job. I should get a reward, not labeled a backstabber. OK, we have our 4K member bolts in place. Transmission cross-member bolts, you got two of them, right? You got one at least on each side for the transmission cross-member bolts? Yes. OK. Who really wants to be called a backstabber? That's not a good look. Uh, what makes it even worse is he sings it to me every time he sees me. Hold me close, tiny backstabber. Count the knives left in my back. <laughs> Lay me down in sheets of betrayal. I know how Jesus felt. It's a little too much for me. The 1969 Charger is a unique, one-of-a-kind masterpiece. It combines beauty, performance, and sheer luxury in one spirited machine. And this eye-catching emblem tells the world that this Charger is something completely new this year. A special edition. The Charger Special Edition is a luxury package that includes genuine leather inserts in sporty tan, blue, green, or black front bucket seats, and a wood grain sports steering wheel. 
the 1969 Special Edition, where luxury meets style. I started working on making these exhaust manifolds about six years ago. That's a long time to wait to get a part done, but I'm a stickler for wanting things to be just right. I will tell you that probably the coolest new part to hit the world of restoration are these exhaust manifolds from Tony. These are the manifolds for you. These are missing. You can't find these. When you do find them on eBay, they're $800 to $1,000 for a set, and you don't know if they're cracked. I've had many exhaust manifolds that looked great, but the passenger manifold would crack out. So even the date. Yep. I mean, you have that date right there, but what if I have a, a March of uh, 70 build car? We That's also, we're doing three different dates. We're doing, and they're pairs. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I, that is the most fantastic thing I have seen hit the aftermarket world. Now, OER's been making a lot of neat stuff. They're making those grill assemblies for our 70 chargers, amongst a thousand other things. But for us, we're always dying. Every car needs that exhaust manifold. If it's a 383 or a 440, a 70 or 71, it needs that manifold. We're doing so nice. August of 69, which is good for the early 1970 model year cars. Yep. We're doing January of 70, which you take care of the last half of the model year. And we're doing August of 1970, which does for the 71 yeah, model. Cover year. all the 71s, yeah. And then we're doing a fourth set that don't have any dates, and we have some original samples. I've seen it. Yeah, that didn't have. I've dates. seen 340 ones that way with no date on them. Yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah. yeah. This is really the best thing that sandwich-eating New York lunatic has done since I've known him, and I've known him a long time. So, in case one of these dates don't fit exactly what you want, you can just have it to be no date and can't be wrong. I always tell people if it's not dated, it's not wrong. Yeah, Graveyard Cars is a great test bed for the products I make because they use them right away. Whereas a lot of time customers will be collecting parts for a car they're gonna restore, but they not, may not get to it for a couple years. So you don't, you don't get the immediate feedback and I need that. You know, Mark and I joke around a lot with each other. We bust on each other, but, but we're buddies. And you know, Mark's a real good guy. Now he's gonna just torture me with it like he does everything. I'm saving you, saving you. I'm happy to have him as a friend and a business partner. Tony and Graveyard Cars probably goes back about 10 years ago. Go all the way back to when we were working on the 1970 Challenge. That's the first time I met him. But that's not the first time I knew him. I talked to Tony on the phone as far back as like 1988. So he had an ad, I think it was in Hemmings for Mopar parts. I had a 1972 Challenger. It was a six cylinder car that I put a 440 in and I wanted to convert it from an automatic to a four speed. It was early days, so there was nothing out there reproduction. So I called this number and of course, you're never gonna forget that voice. Uh, yeah, that there is 72. I know exactly what that there is. Uh, you need the four speed uh, 340? No, no, it's got a 440. I thought that was not right. The 1972 Dodge Challenger was introduced with the 340 in the rally package the last year for the 440. That there is 1971. And you remember that. That sticks with you. So when I talk to him on the phone, uh, that there, ah, that there is Tony D'Agostino. So earlier, I was noticing, you got the pinister, so you, I don't want to get you in trouble with Chrysler. Oh, no, no, we, we paid Chrysler. Okay, then. all right. Yeah. <laughs> little pinister yeah, right No, there. these are licensed by Mopar. They are. Yep. And I mean, this is so incredible to us. Doug, what's the hardest thing to come up with on a 440 these days? Yeah. Exhaust manifolds. Pretty much. I gotta say, this is incredible. You don't know how long and hard we've looked for these things. Even when we find the correct manifolds, they're usually rusted, pitted, and cracked. It will be so nice to install new manifolds. Well, these are so commonly used for older cars. You might have a distributor, but that's specific. But these are all 7071, <clears throat> big block. You know how I come up with manifolds in the old days? How? I steal it from Darren. <laughs> Do you remember the episode, <laughs> buddy? I don't see the joy in reminiscing about something like this. So what, what, what's the point of it? it it's, it's harmful times. Uh, you brought it up, sir. Yeah, I know I brought it up. It's funny. That's my point. I paid Josh to go out and take the manifold off of his car. That's funny. <laughs> it is funny. It was funny back then. It's funny now. You know, everybody wanted to talk about a manifold. Nobody wanted to talk about a manifold. What about that question? Yeah, if I hadn't taken my car out of here, this manifold would have been off mine. Do you have one on your car? No, yeah, we're not taking it off. I'm telling you right now, if Tony can't get me one in the next couple of days, I'm taking the one off your car. No, you're not. Yeah, I most no, certainly you're not. am. Hey, buddy. Darren's original exhaust manifold. It's just easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission with him. You know what I'm saying? What are you talking about? 
Naturally, all 69 Charger and Charger RT models are available in the Special Edition. The Charger Special Edition also includes handsome turn signal indicators and the interior light package with a popular time delay ignition switch light, as well as headlight on reminder, map, courtesy, ash receiver, glove box, and trunk lights. A wood grain instrument panel, bright trimmed brake and accelerator pedals, and wrapping up the special edition are these popular deep dish 14 inch wheel covers with just the right touches of extra luxury to make the captivating new 69 Charger irresistible. Alyssa did a great job applying the hood decals and the header decals on the 1969 CUDA A57. With all that done, I can move on and install the front end of the car. The first thing I install is the Plymouth emblem on the front header panel. And this uses three self-cutting nuts on the back side. And you can see why the decal has to go on first before you install some of the stuff on this car. The next items to install are the grill assemblies. This is a pretty unique grill. It's actually two grill assemblies. I think one of the things that's most time consuming with this is blacking out the honeycomb grill inserts. After the grills are finished and installed, I can put the headlight bezels on. This really just finishes off the headlight assembly nicely. In this case, I installed the passenger side first, but it really doesn't matter. And after that, I just installed the driver's side. <laughs> One of the cool features of this car is the L31 hood mounted turn indicators. I really like the turn indicators, but these ones are chrome and it just gives the just the front of this car a really nice touch. Let's see how many of you have been paying attention. True or false? High bucket seats are standard equipment on the 1969 Special Edition Charger. Do you think you know the answer? Stay tuned after a brief word from our sponsors to find out if you're correct. Welcome back. Are you as smart as you say you are? True or false? High bucket seats are standard equipment on the 1969 Special Edition Charger. If you said false, then congratulations. Maybe you really are smart. The high bucket seats were not available until the following year in 1970. However, the 1969 Charger Special Edition did come with standard leather front bucket seats. Additionally, optional head restraints will be mandatory standard safety equipment on chargers delivered after January 1st, 1969. But certainly one of the most popular 1969 seating options will be this new mechanical custom comfort bucket seat. Two manual controls provide the seated driver with many different adjustments. One control is for fore and aft. The other is for up and down and tilt. Whether it's all-out performance or the look of sports car luxury, Chargers got it. Yeah. Okay, so you got the bosses here for your 7071 yep. heat stove. Yep. Nice. I make that new too. Love this it. Is original, but it goes right on. You know, nice sets of originals right now are really tough to come by because they're 50 years old. You're not going to find NOS manifolds, so they're going to be on cars. They're going to have some level or degree of pitting to them just from the last 50 years of age. The heat rises are just about never working or never there. And that's a couple hundred bucks alone just to get that whole deal straightened out with the heat risers. Here's the right hand one that we're matching up to this. This is where the heat riser goes. Somebody's welded this all up, busted out the heat riser butterfly in the middle of it. I mean, that's what they did because they leaked or they didn't work or they just freeze right. shut or freeze open. Yeah. So they figure who, who cares because most people lose the air cleaners and everything else by yeah. that time anyway. We have so many variations of sizes and markings, like you know the end code and four, and even the way the uh, the date stamps are. 
They yeah, were different. That's what I was going to ask you is even the layout of it. This whole thing looks like it's an intentional piece with fake screws, right? Yeah. Well, Which no, is that, factory. That, no, that was. In, I brought on, one of these. That was on the insert. Hang on, I brought one of these. Oh, there you go. This is one Doug had. Yeah, so, look at all the nice pitting on it. You get away from yeah. the new ones. And no, no heat riser. When you lay these manifolds out side by side and you compare them, the new reproduction is a twin to the original in every conceivable detail. Here, you ready to do this? I've never done it before. I so. haven't either. Oh, wow, okay. Oh, no. We bolt them on cars. Oh, we done it on cars. Wow, I'll take a look, Tim. Now, you're pick pretend I made them. Yeah, I don't <laughs> see any light coming through. I don't either. So wow. We've actually bolted these on mm. engines. Oh, you have? And, and run the engines in retard and got the manifolds. Yeah, it's no, not we proper. retarded the timing. There you go. Smile to make it fire out the exhaust. And we've got the manifolds glowing. And we did cycles like that over and over to make sure that they weren't going to crack. Or You did that on the pre before you went to production? Oh, yeah, yeah. We did that on the last sample sets that we had. I never want to have to make a part that I need to make excuses for. So we go through a lot of R&D for appearance, which is, you know, a big aspect of it because they're licensed by Chrysler. They look exactly like originals. And the funny thing about that is there's many variations of originals. You deal with a lot of reproduction parts more than I do. You know how many of them are less than what they should be to this be This is nice. a good looking product. You know? So for as much crap as I give Tony about being incredibly meticulous and a complete pain in the ass, which he is, both of those things, a finished product like that, it's as good as it gets. If you've got a 70 or a 71 440 HP, 383. And, and th 383 two barrel even on the left, left side, yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, but there's plenty of lefts around. Matter of fact, it's we'll the make... right one that cracked it, that split out. Right. Right here, right? No, right up the middle. Oh, they um, always seem to crack here. I think when we had to borrow Darren's, it was a crack here. It, did somebody just laugh? It's cracked. Right there, see it? Dang it, it's just same old <laughs> Why in the are these? I went through a hundred of them well, and never this. had that one crack. A, that's the same spot, look at that. It's gotta be a weak point. Uh, you, know, you never have to worry about it getting yeah, stuck. Yeah, but your hole's plugged. Yeah, no, no, yeah. you're right, the hole's plugged and it looks like it's yeah. there. Well, you can't wait to say no, no, huh? For me, it's just everything's no, no. I'll say, yeah, George Washington's first president. No, 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 no. He was the president at the beginning of the country. Yeah, that's the first president. Well, you say it wherever you want. Well, I'm just saying, I just can't win. <laughs> One thing I want to say about Mark, like I said, we goof around a lot. We get on each other. We try to one up each other. But he's like a brother from another mother. I mean, we're just real tight. We're close. We both have very busy schedules, but we have a good time when we do have time to sit down a little bit and connect. And I know sometimes he gets a bad rap or, or he gets a hard time from people on the internet or just want to run him down. Mark's a really good guy. Brought to you by Mark Madness. The trade. Ever do my boxing? Mark Madness. That's not Mark Madness. I've never done that with you, Rocky, have I? Who have you not done it with? If anybody ever comes to Mark with an issue with any of his cars that he's done, I've never seen him say no or not do the right thing or try to take care of it. You know, that, that's integrity, and you don't really find that a lot today. And it makes it really good to deal with Mark on a level like that, and that's why I never feel bad about sticking up for him. But don't tell him I said that. <laughs> now Tony wants to move out to the West Coast. All that crazy East Coast stuff is gonna last about 37 seconds when he moves into Southern California. He tries that stuff down there and they're gonna hand him his lunch. Uh, uh somebody tell you that. <clears throat> nah, 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 this ain't New York. Okay, welcome to the West Coast.